Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. This is a special South by Southwest edition of Fast Forward, and we're talking to some of the pioneers of the digital revolution. I have one of those pioneers with me. I am very excited to have Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, uh, holder of more than 1,000 patents, and the founder of Deca Labs with me here today. Dean, thanks so much for coming on and talking to me. It's great to be here. I'm super excited to meet you in person. Um, I've been following your work, uh, not through your entire career quite, but, um, but through, certainly through the later stages of it. And it's really amazing the, the range of things that you've invented. Um, we were talking before we lit up that uh, a lot of people say you credit you with about 500 patents. Uh, that number is well over 1,000 at this point. Um, and you know, I want to get to the point, just a quick rundown of the things that you've invented. The Segway is the biggest one, the one that uh, a lot of people talk about, a lot of people see it's the most visible thing that people may have seen. But the world's first drug infusion pump uh, the home choice portable dialysis machine, uh, the defense department robotic, the defense department funded robotic arm, the Luke hand, um, and the slingshot water purifier, which uh, can actually operate on cow dung. Um, that's a range of things, and none of them are apps. They're all real things. Um, out of all those innovations and all, out of everything else, is there an invention that you're most proud of? I've been asked, in fact, more recently, more often I am asked, what's your favorite and most important invention. And after giving it a lot of thought, my answer is always the same. I don't know, it hasn't happened yet. Because I think the definition of old is when you spend your time looking back. The definition of young is what can I do with more tools, more time, more expertise, more resources, more experience from all the failures. What can I do going forward? And you always want to do the next project should be bigger and better. And it ought to be. You have more time, more skill, more resources. I now have 500 engineers. And I like the definition of young. I don't like the definition of old. I don't plan to get old. So my, que my answer to your question, what's our best invention, I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. But I hope we will continue to work on projects that if I'm lucky enough or maybe uh, tenacious enough that they come to be, I hope that our, we continue to make technologies that meet the real needs of real people to improve lives around the world. So let's talk about that tenacity, because I think it's something that um, is a hallmark of, of both you and DECA. Um, just talk a little bit about the, the innovation process. Like, What are you doing up there in Manchester, New Hampshire, that is uh, different than any other uh, think tank or innovation center? Well, I think you hit it with tenacity. Again, I'm asked very frequently about what does it take uh, to be an inventor. And my answer, again, is always the same. You have to get comfortable failing, and then failing again, and then failing again, and then you'll fail. As long as, you know, if you fall down seven times, but you stand up eight, you're doing just fine. If you don't get comfortable with failing, you ought to get into a job or a profession or a career where there's already a basis of something that's working pretty well, and you can work at incrementally changing it or imp incrementally improving it or making it a little better or a little cheaper. And that's what most of the world does. And that's a good thing, by the way. That's called a stable world. Mm -hmm. Things don't spontaneously change by huge amounts very often. And when they do, they generally shake up industries and shake up countries and shake up cultures. And we don't want a lot of that. But properly focused, if you work on a big problem by saying, I'm going to bring to that big problem a whole new approach. They used to do it mechanically, I'll do it electronically. They used to do it electronically, I'll do it with software. They used to do it this way, I'll do it that way. But you're starting with a whole new tool set, the current technologies that might not have been available when the standard for that problem was created. If you tr start looking at an old problem with a new set of tools, you don't know which way to go. You don't know what's going to work. So you fail a lot. You stumble a lot. You know, we all remember, you know, the first man on the moon. Nobody remembers the second. We all know Lewis and Clark figured out how to get to California. Nobody knows who went second. They had a map, it's no big deal. Mm. But the guys that went the first time didn't take a straight path, they didn't have a map. They spent a lot of time, two steps forward, one step back. This didn't work, that didn't work. If, you're, if you can get yourself comfortable with failing and you can let a project fail without letting it be a failure of the person or the team, if you can pick yourself up and keep going, then you wanna be an inventor. 
because it's pretty damn exciting when it works. And it, it doesn't have to work all the time. If, if, you know, if one out of 10 of your shots gets, you know, everybody remembers Babe Ruth, I think, as like the best hitter or something. He was also the guy that struck out the most. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You, you, they, they go together. So the simple advice I'd give anybody is don't think inventors are these people that run around yelling, Eureka, it worked. You know, there's this, there's this gilded view of entrepreneurs are out there being successful and making money and inventors come up with these great ideas overnight in the shower. Most of the entrepreneurs I know were overnight successes after 10 or 15 or 20 years. Most of the inventors I know would spend most of their time failing and failing and failing until finally it worked. And I was researching some of your inventions, and it, it almost seems that a lot of these discoveries are made accidentally. Um, I mean, obviously, you're working on a problem, you're in that neighborhood, you're, but you don't necessarily know the outcome, and the, the thing that works may not be the thing that you thought was going to work. So saying that this final s solution that worked, we found accidentally, might be a little extreme, but I absolutely agree with you. Um, it's not that we started out assuming this is the solution and we just did the incremental work to get there. We might have been working on a problem in fluid flow or drug delivery, and we might have been also working with some of my engineers that design helicopters, and some problem that gets solved in one space turns out to have the fundamentals of, wait a minute, can we do that again in some other space? So. It's probably not accidental if you work at the interface of a lot of different technologies, in fact, at a lot of different whole industries. It's probably not accidental, uh, serendipitous, uh, opportunistic. Uh, but yes, I'd say a lot of the things that we have eventually succeeded with, we succeeded with the core technology being very different than what we would have started that, that long path to success with. And that's part of what makes inventing exciting. You're also sort of, people think about innovation in Silicon Valley, they think about it in Boston with MIT, all these different corridors. You're based in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, how does that make recruiting talent different? How does it make the innovation process different? And then the output of what you actually accomplish? Because it doesn't seem like it's hurt it much. Well, I grew up in New York, and one would argue that there aren't a lot of places as different as New York City and Manchester. Uh, there are probably a few giant buildings in New York that have as many uh, addresses as the city of Manchester, or for that matter, the state of New Hampshire. But every license plate up there says, live free or die. And I didn't move to a place far away from the world because that would be too limiting. But if you look at where my office is in Manchester, I'm less than an hour from downtown Boston, from MIT and Harvard and Tufts and BU. And where I sit in Manchester, I'm way less than an hour in the other direction from Dartmouth and the University of New Hampshire. And I've got plenty of universities to draw on. I have lots of talent that says, I want to do tech stuff. I'm not a farmer. I don't need an eight-month growing season with nice fertile. You know, I'd probably be in you know, San Joaquin Valley for that. Mm -hmm. I, if you're in the tech space, uh, what you want to do is have access to a high density of really smart people. But if you do it by being in Silicon Valley or in Boston or in New York or now Brooklyn, which is sort of next door for the same reason we're next door, if you, if you want to be right in the middle of it, what you find is part of the price you pay to be at that hub of energy is insane cost of living. It's, you, you would spend more money trying to find a place to keep a car for a month in Boston than being able to rent a nice place to live in New Hampshire. And I think the best of all worlds is to be in a place like New Hampshire, in a city like Manchester, that's close enough to all these resources when you need them, but far enough away that, for instance, I can land a helicopter, which I do every day at my house on, on acres and acres of land. And when I take off, as I come above the trees, I can see the Prudential Center and the Hancock building on the horizon. I can be there very quickly. 
but I can then go land on the roof of my 160-year-old mill building where I now have a million square feet of space in these mills that at one time were the largest single industrial complex in the United States in the 1830s to 1860s when this newfangled technology of automatic programmed knitting machines mm -hmm. created the textile industry. And I think that mill is going to reemerge as the home of regenerative manufacturing. And I think our ability to draw really extraordinary technology people that want to work on really cool projects, but don't want to live in a highly congested, very expensive place. It's probably not a good place for family. It's probably not a good place for some of your hobbies. And by the way, from Manchester, instead of going an hour south, where there's typically no traffic, you go an hour north where there's hardly any traffic, and you're in ski country, or you're in the lakes country, or you go out to the ocean. So to me, I move to a place by which I can have whatever environment I want very quickly. So let's talk a little bit about regenerative manufacturing. Um, you are trying to make Manchester a center, a hub of regenerative manufacturing with a, a, a I haven't seen it, but a, what sounds like a pretty amazing facility. Um, can you talk about the organization, the initiatives, and then sort of the approach that you're bringing to um, what was essentially a biological science. So you just hit the magic. It was, and I still believe will continue to be, a biological science. And with no false modesty, I'll tell you, I have very little knowledge of biology, biological science, medicine. I know I've spent nearly four decades designing and building equipment for the medical community. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make me competent in medicine, biology, proteomics, genomics. But when the Department of Defense put out this proposal, they basically said, we understand. We, the DOD, said, we understand that there's billions and billions of dollars have been spent creating the miracles of modern biology, modern medicine. And there isn't a major med school in the country that doesn't have some group of folks that have won or will soon win the Nobel Prize for in this Petri dish or in this roller bottle creating some miracle. Look, we could grow what looks like a human ear on the, on the back of a mouse. Everybody's seen that famous picture. It's 20 picture. years old now. That's the problem. It's amazing. That's 20 years ago. And in that 20 years, I don't want to say nothing's happened. It's worse than that. So much has happened. There's more and more capability to do more and more of that stuff in all of these laboratories. But in each and every one of these laboratories, you have brilliant scientists and MDs and PhDs that know how to create their miracle. But it's not going to spontaneously jump out of that Petri dish and tomorrow morning there's going to be a giant factory that has capacity to do, you know, design, development, tooling, verification, validation, FDA approval. The entire manufacturing process, and by the way, most scientists don't know what manufacturing really is. Why should they? Most guys in manufacturing wouldn't know how to create a molecule that will grow into be a, you know, a, a, a kidney or a pancreas. But we looked at what the DOD was looking for, and we said to them, to be clear, guys, we are not going to spend any time doing medical research. The NSF and the NIH and the big endowments and the med schools, they'll do that. We are not going to spend any time doing the clinical trials. We have partners for that, as we do now for mm -hmm. all my products. What I said to them was, what I think is the missing link here is the world of engineering and sophisticated manufacturing technology by which you could put, you know, three billion transistors mm -hmm. for a couple hundred bucks into somebody's pocket. The world of manufacturing sophisticated stuff has screamed ahead over the last couple of decades. And the world of the magic in the miracles in the medical community has screamed at, but they don't interact. I said to them, let's create a not-for-profit organization that sits as the linkage between all these miracles and the capabilities that if we could bring them to the table could do for these people what, for instance, Silicon Valley ended up doing when Shockley and Bardeen invented the transistor at Bell Labs. They didn't go from, I won the Nobel Prize, I figured out the, the fundamentals of, of molecular interactions that allows some material like gallium arsenide or germanium or something to become a semiconductor. They didn't go from, I understand the physics of semiconductors to suddenly, I have a wafer fab operation. I, I don't know that this is accurate, but I can't think of any products that Bell Labs shipped. My point to you is, 
Bell Labs is a lab. Mm -hmm. And what happened was an industry grew to take the incredible understandings these scientists delivered and said, how do I apply them to create products that can change the world? And what we said to the Department of Defense is, look, we're not the labs that do this basic research, but we know where they are. And we aren't going to do the high volume manufacturing, but I know where they are. In fact, the largest company that does automation in the country is Rockwell Automation. Mm -hmm. The name automation in the name of a giant company, multi-billion dollar giant. I said to the guys, you know, I doubt you and these scientists and these medical researchers ever had meetings with Rockwell Automation. They make the cabinets full of stuff to make automated lines, you know, for, for the car companies, where they figure out how to make the semiconductor industry work to higher quality, better standards, lower cost. But I said, we need guys like that. I called the chairman of that company, Blake Moret, and said, Blake. <laughs> first thing he said was, Dean, we're supporting first as much as we can. I said, <laughs> okay, I already gave this year. I said, I got a better, better call for you this time. Instead of just asking, which he's been phenomenally supportive of first, I'm here to give back. I'm here to give you a vision of an opportunity to create a whole new industry that you can be at the, you know, the forefront. You know, you've helped automate the automotive giants. You've helped automate uh, the Silicon Valley giants. Let's automate the process of making human replacement organs. The, the science in many cases is almost there. It's not done, there's a lot of work, but the scientists are screaming along. Let's start early to take the handoff from them and build out the processes to get this done. And by the way, one of the reasons we're excited to be here is to make any process like that work, you also have to have standards. Mm -hmm. You have to know what you're doing and you have to be able to prove you did it that way. So we went to the Food and Drug Administration early on and the most senior guy there that sort of develops policies for these new different things, resigned. 17 years of seniority at the FDA, an MD, PhD, brilliant guy. We told him our vision, but we said, boy, this isn't gonna be incremental. How's the FDA gonna deal with this? He agreed that the best way he could help us is resign from the FDA, pack up his stuff down in Washington, move to New Hampshire and help me build a team to do the regulatory stuff. And he did it and he's now in New Hampshire with us. In the same way, you go to a place like IEEE and say, look, the world couldn't build communication systems if everybody that makes a chipset uses you use CDMA, you use T you the chip makers, nobody could build the infrastructure and the ecosystem that makes an industry like Silicon Valley work unless they were coordinated right, right down to the base components from which they start building things and lithography. So, you know, having IEEE uh, as somebody that can be standing there ready to help us create standards, create documents so that all the different engineering disciplines that are going to be needed to do this know how to communicate and know how to cooperate is what we're doing. We, we got this thing going. We have more than 80 companies that have said, engineering and manufacturing companies, count us in. And something like 26 major world-class medical research institutions, count us in. And we're going to sit in the middle and be the bridge that connects these two worlds. So what are the first products? And by products, I mean organs, tissue replacements. What are the first things that that you think are going to be available on a mass level? Well, I'm glad you threw in tissue replacement because you said, what are the first? And then you said organs. Yeah, organs may not so, be first. So <laughs> organs are probably not going to be first. Um, but to your point, uh, we believe that we've got to get the processes down. We have to come up with some baseline pre-competitive tools that everybody's going to need. You know, the semiconductor industry, these companies all compete with each other at their final product. My processor, your processor, his DSP, his memory chip, his analog. But they all want to be able to buy wafers at the highest quality, at the most reasonable cost. They all need to share certain standards and tools. So we said, what, where should we start developing this whole engineering tool set and communication system? And we said, let's start with cells and then tissues simple tissues, and by the way, since most of the original funding came from the Department of Defense, that's why we call it ARMY, because, you know, but everybody thinks it's A-R-M-Y, it's A-R-M-I, mm -hmm. and the other reason we call it that is because the M, you know, when you say the word regenerative, everybody thinks the next word is medicine. It's regenerative medicine. We said, no, no, 
We are a not-for-profit called ARMI, but it's Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. We're not doing the medicine. We're doing the manufacturing for that community. But we've now had a few meetings with all of these members, and we said, let's start, for instance, by saying, let's figure out how to scale up cells. Let's figure out how to scale up certain kinds of tissue. And since it was the Department of Defense that came up with the first $80 million, we owe it to them to focus on what they need right up front. And a lot of these war fighters come back, they need skin because of really, really brutal burns. They need cartilage, they need bone. So we said, look, let's start with simple cells, then go to simple homogeneous tissue, then more complex tissue, then pieces of organs, and then finally whole organs. So the, for a timeline, what I'll tell you I'm on the hook for is, while I said, look, you can't promise anything in the world of invention. You can schedule and budget the 2% improvement in your product next year over this year, but when you want whole new things, uh, it's very hard to schedule miracles. But what we told the DOD is, we believe within five years, we will have gotten enough done and we will have gotten enough of the regulatory process to find and in place, working with people like the Food and Drug Administration and some of the big uh, organizations like IEEE. We said, we will at least be in the path, in the regulatory process, or have out there being used at scale some result of the work we've done in regenerative manufacturing. Now, how many more years will it take before, you know, there's a headline that somebody has an entire artificial heart or kidney or lung in them? I don't know, but I will tell you, optimists always tend to be wrong on one side. Mm -hmm. Pessimists are always way, way more wrong on the other because they think things will never happen, and they're always wrong. So I don't want to run the risk of looking like the overly optimistic uh, naive inventor, but I'll tell you, um, we're going to transform uh, healthcare, and it not only improves the quality of life, it's also going to solve another problem. This country is heading towards bankrupting itself by giving people very expensive, chronic health care because we can't cure that kidney problem. We can't cure so we're going to treat you. Well, first of all, nobody likes chronic treatment, and second of all, chronic treatment is unbelievably expensive. But if you could show up at a hospital and they could take out the organ that's failed and put in a brand new one, and the brand new one's made from your DNA, so you don't need to spend the rest of your life on immunosuppressive so you don't reject it, you have a better quality of life. You've eliminated the expensive chronic care. Everybody wins. And I think you're going to see a transformation in quality of life, health care delivery, and health care cost as a result of the successes of regenerative manufacturing. I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got another uh, engagement shortly after this one. But uh, before you go, I've got to give you an opportunity to talk about FIRST. Thank you uh, for that. I've been working on it for a very long time. And it seems like, if anything, it's getting stronger and stronger and, and growing in, uh, more than ever. So talk to me about so FIRST. So this year, FIRST, just to put a perspective, it's now we've had competitions for more than 25 consecutive years. In the very first year, we had 23 companies that adopted 23 schools local to where they were. And it took me the whole country. You know, like Boeing sent a team in that first year from Seattle. Now Boeing has, I don't know, 100 teams. Boeing sponsors whole regionals. The chairman of Boeing is on our board of directors. But you look at the 3,700 corporate sponsors we have. And this year, in January, because we always kick off the new game, the new rules, the exciting new kit in January. And then we give them two months to work. And then we start March Madness, which mm -hmm. started this weekend. Well, this year we have more than 61,000 schools and around this country and around the world there will be 160 regional events throughout March. There are certain weekends in March, this week and next week, there'll be 25 or 30 cities, you know, New York, mm -hmm. Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Jose, Cleveland, it's the biggest country. The biggest school, the biggest cities in the country, or the biggest schools, you know, universities. We have 200 universities that will give us in excess of 75 million dollars in scholarships this year because they want these first kids. But then our championship has it had to be divided this year. We'll be back in Houston like the 17th, 18th, 19th of April for one, and we'll fill that stadium. And then three days later, we go to. 
uh, Detroit uh, to the new Kobo Center. But we'll have probably a couple of thousand teams at those championships. I think uh, 25 years in, the amazing thing is that the uh, the kids that were doing it 25 years ago they're the mentors are now. now the mentors and the corporate sponsors and they're they're using it as a recruiting tool so it, I think you've crossed over to the point where it's a self-sustaining system now I think if you talk to every major corporate sponsor and I am always profusely thanking them for their incredible support at this point they'll say to me Dean don't thank us this is the best recruiting tool we have in fact the largest single sponsor of teams we have this year is the United States Department of Defense mm -hmm between Annapolis and West Point and the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And, uh, you know, when you look at the Naval Academy and, and uh, all of these groups are so desperate, they're competing for the best and the brightest because like never before have we realized, especially with a very small military in this country, if they don't have the best and the brightest to use these advanced technologies, they're toast. So whether you're a major corporation, a startup, the government, NASA's our second largest team, team host. NASA this year delivered well over 250 teams. The Department of Defense, over 1,000. I think every smart group, the leadership has figured out the most important thing they can invest in is their future workforce. And there's no better way to get to kids and create more of them uh, than to invest uh, in the first community. So we're excited, and I would beg all of your uh, readers and listeners to go to the firstinspires.com website and look for an event somewhere near them. It's an exciting competition. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it, 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 it's as exciting as any other sport, except in our sport, every kid on every team can turn pro. And you see kids beating them. The robots beating each other up, but the kids, gracious professionalism. The kids are in a cooperation. They work with each other. And one last one on first. Last year, we decided to build an international version of it that we now call First Global. So your readers or listeners mm -hmm. should go to first.global. And we had 157 different countries, each send one team to Constitution Hall last July to demonstrate that we can get kids around the world to work together on complex technical problems. Mm -hmm. And on August 15th through August 18th, six months from now, I believe we'll have closer to 180 countries convening in the largest arena in Mexico City uh, for the 2018 first global challenge, which is all about energy. And I really hope that everybody that's watching, listening to your stuff, will think of some country in the world that they have some passion or connection to, 54 countries in Africa and all the countries in developing parts of the world that need a little help to get their team, to get to Mexico City. Last year of the 50, 157 teams, alphabetically from, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, you can go look at our website and when you get to the T's, you find one that's not Tanzania, that's, it's Team Hope. What's with this Team Hope? There's seven kids. These kids were Team Hope because they have no country. country. They were from a refugee camp, and we want them back. So if your listeners care about the future of the world and the next generation of kids and can see the opportunity for the first time in human history to network kids all over the world in a cooperative way, they should go to first dot global and figure out how to adopt the country and help us. Excellent. It's a, we will put the links in our show notes and we will definitely cover the competition. Dean Kamen, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you very much. That's Fast Forward for today. If you want back episodes of this show, you can find them on PCMag.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the future.